Chapter 5 On Night Street Granny's mind was getting more and more muddled. Lina would come home in the evenings and find her rifling through kitchen cupboards, surrounded by cans and jars with their lids off, or tearing the covers off her bed and trying to lift up the mattress with her skinny arms. It was an important thing, she would say. The thing that was lost. But if you don't know what it was, said Lina, how will you know when you found it? Granny didn't try to answer this question. She just flapped her hands at Lina and said, never mind, never mind, never mind, and kept on searching. These days, Mrs. Murdo spent a great deal of time sitting by their window rather than her own. She would tell Granny she was just coming over to keep her company. I don't want her to keep me company, Granny complained to Lina. And Lina said, maybe she's lonely, Granny. Let her come. Lina rather liked having Mrs. Murdo around. It was, it was a bit like having a mother there. She wasn't anything like Lina's own mother, who had been a dreamy, absent-minded sort of person. Mrs. Murdo was mother-like in quite a different way. She made sure they all ate good breakfast in the morning, usually potatoes with mushroom gravy and beet tea. She lined, with, lined up the vitamin pills with each per, by each person's plate and made sure they were swallowed. When Mrs. Murdo was there, shoes were, got picked up and put away, spills were wiped off the furniture, and Poppy had always on, had on clean clothes. Lina could relax when Mrs. Murdo was around. She knew things were taken care of. Every week, Lina, like all the workers between the ages of 12 and 15, had Thursday off. One Thursday, she was standing in the line at the Garn Square Market, hoping to get a bag of turnips for stew that night. She overheard a startling conversation between two people standing behind her. What I wanted, said one voice, was some paint for my front door. It hasn't been painted for years. It's gray and peeling, horrible. I heard the store over on Knight Street had some. I was hoping for blue. Blue would be nice, said the other voice wistfully. But when I got there, the first voice continued, the man said he had no paint, never had. Disagreeable man. All that he, all that he had were a few colored pencils. <gasps> colored pencils? Lida had not seen colored pencils in any store for ages. Once she had two red ones and a blue one and a brown one. She'd used these for her drawings until there were stubs too small to hold. Now she only had one plain pencil left and it was rapidly growing shorter. She longed to have colored pencils for her pictures of the imaginary city. She had a feeling that it was a colorful place, though she didn't know what its colors might be. There were other things, of course, on which her money could be spent. Granny's only coat was full of holes and coming apart at the seams, but Granny rarely went out, Lina told herself. She was either at home or in her yarn shop. She didn't really need a new coat, did she? Besides, how much could a few pencils cost? And she could probably get a coat for Granny and some pencils. So that afternoon, she set out for Night Street. She took Poppy with her. Poppy had learned how to ride piggyback. She wrapped her legs around Lina's waist and gripped Lina's throat with her small, strong fingers. On Budlow Street, people were standing in long lines with their bundles of laundry at the washing stations. The washers stirred the clothes in the washing machines with long poles. In past days, the machines themselves had whirled the clothes around, but not one of them worked anymore. Lina turned up Hafter Street, where the four street lamps were still out and the building crew was repairing a partly collapsed roof. roof. Orly Gordon called up, out to her from high on the ladder, and Lina looked up and waved. Looked up and waved. Farther on, she passed a woman with bits of rope and string for sale and a man pulling a cart full of carrots and beets to the grocery store. At the corner, a cluster of children played catch with a rag ball. The streets were alive with people today. Moving fast, Lina threaded her way among them. But as she went to Otterwill Street, she saw something that made her slow down. The man, or a man, was standing on the steps of the gathering hall, shouting and howling, and a crowd of people had gathered around him. Lina went closer, and she saw who it was. Her insides gave a lurch. It was Sage Merrill. His arms flailed wildly, and his eyes were stretched open wide. In a high, rapid voice, he wailed out in a stream of words. I've been to the, under, the unknown regions, he cried. There is nothing, nothing, nothing there. Do you think that something out there might save us? Ha! There's only darkness and monsters, darkness and terrible deep holes, darkness forever. 
The rats are the size of houses. The rocks are as sharp as knives. The darkness sucks out your breath. No hope for us out there. Oh no, no hope, no hope. He went on like this for a few minutes and then crumpled to the ground. A few people watching him looked at each other and shook their heads. Gone mad, Lina heard someone say. Yes, completely, said someone else. Suddenly Sage sprang up again and resumed his terrible shouting. The crowd stepped back. Some of them hurried away. A few of them approached Sage, speaking in calming voices. They took him by the arms and led him, still shouting down the steps. Who dat? Who dat? said Poppy in her small, piercing voice. Linda turned away from the miserable spectacle. Hush, Poppy, she said. It's a poor, sad man. He doesn't feel well. We mustn't stare. She headed toward Knight Street, which ran along Greengate Square. There was a stringy-haired man that sat cross-legged on the ground playing a flute made out of drain pipe. And five or six believers circled him, clapping and singing. Soon, soon, coming soon, they sang. What's coming soon, Lina wondered. But she didn't stop to ask. Two blocks beyond, she came to a store that had no sign in the window. This must be the one, she thought. At first it looked closed. Its window was dark. But the door opened, and when she pushed on it, and a bell attached to the knob clanked. From the back of the room came a black-haired man with big teeth and a long neck. Yes, he said. Lina recognized him. He was the one who had given her the message for the mayor on the, her very first day of work. His name was Hooper. No, Looper, that was it. Do you have pencils for sale? She asked. It seemed doubtful. The shop shelves were empty except for a few stacks of used paper. Poppy squirmed on Lina's back and whimpered a little. Sometimes, said Looper. Poppy's whimper became a wail. All right, you can get down, said Lina to her. She set her on the floor where she trotted about unsteadily. What I'd like to see, said Lina, are your colored pencils, if you have any. We have a few, said Looper. They are somewhat expensive. He smiled, showing his pushy teeth. Can I see them? said Lina. He went to the back room and returned a moment later, carrying a small box, which he set down on the counter. He took off the lid and Lina bent forward to look. Inside the box were at least a dozen colored pencils. Red, green, blue, yellow, purple, orange. They had never been sharpened. Their, flat, their ends were flat. They had erasers. Lina's heart gave a fa few fast beats. Um, how much are they? She asked. Probably too much for you, said the man. Probably not. I have a job. Oh, good, good, said the man, smiling again. No need to take offense. He picked up the yellow pencil and twirled it between his finger, fingers. Each pencil, he said, five dollars. Five dollars? For seven, you could buy a coat. It would be an old patch coat, but still warm. That's too much, said Lina. He shrugged and began to put the lid back on the box. But maybe, Lina's thoughts raced, let me look at them again. Once more, the man lifted the lid and Lina bent over the pencils. She picked one up. It was painted a dear, deep clear blue, and on its flat top was a blue dot of the lead. The pink eraser was held by a shiny metal collar. So beautiful. I could buy just one, Lina thought. Then I could save a little more and buy a coat for Granny next month. Make up your mind, said the man. I have other customers who are interested if you aren't. All right, I'll take one. No, wait. It was like hunger, a hunger, what she felt. It was the same as when she, ha when her hand sometimes reached to buy, reached out itself to grab a piece of food. It was too strong to resist. I'll take two, she said. And a faint, da dazzly feeling came over her at the thought of what she was doing. Which two, the man said. There were more colors in the box of pencils than in all of Ember. Ember's colors were so much the same. Gray buildings, gray streets, black sky. Even the colors of people's clothes were faded from long use into mud green, rust red, and gray blue. But these colors, they were as bright as the leaves and flowers in greenhouses. Lina's hand hovered over the pencils. The blue one and the yellow. No, the, the... The man made an impatient noise in the back of his throat. The green one, said Lina. I'll take blue and green. She lifted them out of the box and she took the money from the pocket of her coat and handed it to the man. 
She put the pencils in her pocket. They were hers now. She felt a fierce, defiant joy. She turned to go, and that was when she saw the baby was no longer in the store. Poppy, she cried. She whirled around. Did you see my little sister go out? She asked the man. Did you see which way he went? She went. He shrugged. Didn't notice, he said. Lina darted into the street and looked in both directions. She saw lots of people, some children, but no Poppy. She stopped an old woman. Have you seen a little girl, a baby, walking by herself in a green jacket with a hood? The old woman just stared with dull eyes and shook her head. Poppy! Poppy! Her voice rose to a shout. Such, like, such a little baby couldn't have gone so far, she thought. Maybe down toward Green Gate Square, where there were more people walking around, and she began to run. Then the lights flickered, and they flickered again and went out. Darkness slammed in front of her like a wall. She stumbled, caught herself, and stood still. She could absolutely see nothing. Shouts of alarm came up and down the street, and then silence. Lina stretched her arms out. She was facing the street or a building. Terror swept through her. I must just stand still, she thought. The lights will come on again in a few seconds. They always do. But she thought of Poppy alone in the blackness, and her legs went weak. I must find her. She took a step. When she didn't bump into anything, she took another step. And her fingers of her right hand crumpled against something hard. The wall of a building, she thought. Keeping her hand against it, she turned left a little and took a little st another step forward. Then suddenly her hand touched empty air. This would be Deadlock Street. Or had she passed Deadlock Street already? She couldn't keep the picture of the streets clear in her mind. The darkness seemed to fill not, to fill not just the city around her, but inside of her head as well. Heart pounding, she waited. Come back, lights, she pleaded. Please come back. She wanted to call out to Poppy, to tell her to stand still and not to be afraid that she would come for her soon. But the darkness pressed against her and she couldn't summon her voice. She could hardly breathe. She wanted to claw the darkness away from her eyes as if it were someone's hands. Small sounds came from here and there around. A whimpering, a shuffling. In the distance, someone called out incoherently. How many minutes had gone by? The longest blackout ever had been three minutes and 14 seconds. Surely this was longer. She could have endured it if she had been on her own. It, it was the thought of Poppy, lost, that she couldn't stand. And lost because she had been paying more attention to the box of pencils. Oh, if she hadn't been selfish and greedy. And now she was so, so sorry. She made herself take another step forward. But then she thought... What if I'm going away from Poppy? She began to tremble, and she felt the sinking and dissolving inside of her that meant she was going to cry. Her legs gave way like wet paper, and she slid down against the wall she was and was sitting on the street. With her head on her knees, trembling, her mind with her mind a wordless whirl of dread, and she waited. An endless time went by. A moan came from somewhere to the left. A door slammed closed. Footsteps started, then stopped. And into Lina's mind floated the beginning of the worst question. What if the lights never... She squeezed her arms around her knees and made the question stop. Lights come back, she said to herself. Lights come back. And suddenly they did. Lina sprang up and there was the street again and people looking upward with their mouths hanging open. All around people started crying or wailing or grinning in grief in relief. Then all at once, everyone started to hurry, moving fast toward the safety of their homes in case it should happen again. Lina ran toward Greengate Square, stopping everyone she passed. Did you see a little girl walking by herself before the lights went out? Green jacket with a hood? But no one wanted to listen to her. On B Street, on the B Street side of the square stood a few people all talking at once and waving their arms. Lina ran up to them and asked her a question. They stopped talking and stared at her. How could we have seen anyone? The lights were out, said Namney Proggs, a tiny old woman whose back was so bent that she had to twist her head sideways to look up. No, she wandered away before the lights went out. She got away from me. She may have come this direction. You have to keep your eyes on a baby, said Namney Prog, scolded. Babies need watching, said one of the women who had been singing with the believers. But someone else said, oh, a toddler? Green jacket? And he walked over to an open shop door and called, do you have the baby in there? And through the door came someone leading Poppy by hand. Lina dashed to her and lifted her up. Poppy broke out into loud wails. 
You're all right now, said Lina, holding her tightly. Don't worry, sweetie. You, you were just lost for a moment, and now you're all right. I've got you. Don't worry. When she looked to thank the person who had found her, she saw the face and recognized it was Dune. He looked the same as when she had seen him last, except his hair was shaggier. He had on the same baggy brown jacket that he always wore. She was marching up the street by herself, he said. No one knew who she belonged to, so I took her into my father's shop. She belongs to me, said Lina. She's my sister. I was so afraid that she was lost. I thought she might fall and hurt herself or, or be knocked over. Anyway, thank you so much for rescuing her. Anyone would have, said Dune. He frowned and looked down at the pavement. Poppy had calmed down and she was curled up against Lina's chest with her thumb in her mouth. And your job, how is it? The pipe works. Dune shrugged his shoulders. All right, interesting anyway. She waited, but it seemed that that was all he was going to say. Well, thank you again, she said, and she hoisted Poppy around her back. Lucky for you, Dune Harrow was around, said Namni Proggs, who had been watching them with her sideways glare. He's a good-hearted boy. Anything breaks at my house, he fixes it. She hobbled after Lina, shaking a finger at her. You'd better watch that baby more carefully, she called. You shouldn't leave her alone, the flute player added. I know, said Lina. You're right. When she got home, she put the tired baby to bed in the bedroom they shared. Granny had been taking an afternoon nap in the front room and hadn't noticed the blackout at all. Lina told her that the lights had gone out for a few minutes, but she didn't mention anything about Poppy getting lost. Later in the bedroom, with Poppy asleep, she took the two colored pencils from her pocket. They were not quite as beautiful as they had been. When she held them, she remembered the powerful wanting she had felt in the dusty store, and the feeling of it was mixed with fear and shame and darkness.